Right, hello everybody. You know, this is my favorite conference in, in the whole world. It's my favorite conference in the cycle for a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, mainly you. Um, uh, I think that the, the people that we have in the, in the open source community um, have at their heart this extraordinarily generous view uh, of what's possible. You don't necessarily pick up that impression if you read the mailing lists, um, but at heart, you know, I think there is something here about doing awesome stuff for other people. Um, of course, everything's relative, and my other big hobby is beekeeping. So compared to beekeeping, you know, spending time on open source mailing lists is wonderful. Um, um, in this place, amazing things happen. Uh, because the, the, the truly amazing thing about open source tools is, is they end up getting used to do things that even the people who wrote the tools couldn't dream of. And, and that's the profound difference, I think, between the, the open source world and the proprietary world. You know, in the proprietary world, um, you're on rails. Uh, tools get built so that you can do something. Uh, and, and what you can do is defined. But in the open source world, the tools end up getting combined and put together in completely new ways, get, getting repurposed, reappropriated. So, so I can't wait to see what happens when, when two of our keynote speakers this morning get together. You know, if we have cortical learning and uh, remotely controlled drones, um, things are going to get really exciting in about five years' time. Um, so because of this core idea of open source being about um, the tools of possibility, I wanted to, I wanted to call um, this morning's keynote uh, the art of redefining what's possible. Because you know, in Ubuntu, we get, um, we get credit for you know, an, an incredible array of goodies that come in the box. But the reality is most of that credit um, belongs to people in this room, right? The leaders and the participants and the contributors to this enormous array of, of open source projects. Um, but in our own way, we do try to say, you know, as an aggregator, as a, as a, as, as a, as a, as a, a body that's responsible for delivering all of this extraordinary stuff into the hands of um, the people who will invent with it, you know, what can we do to, to redefine what's possible? And right now, um, there are two big areas where we, we're trying to do that. One is, um, on the client side, uh, you know, the, the personal computing side of things. And the, the core story there for us, of course, is touch and uh, mobility. And the core story for us fundamentally is convergence, the idea that, um, that this device in your pocket um, is, in fact, the future version of this device in a very real um, and profound way. The, the big news this week, obviously, was the announcement of the Ubuntu Edge. And this is actually a physical mock-up um, of the Ubuntu Edge. Can I see who here has, has gone to Intigogo and backed that project? I just want to say a huge thank you. There are 10,000 people around the world who have backed that project. Um, I think we are uh, we're at about $4.8 or $4.9 million into the campaign two days in. Um, you have helped us smash those early records. Um, and if we're able to do that, I think there are, there are a couple of really profound things uh, that come from it. One is the device itself. The device itself essentially is, is stretching what's possible in your hand to a class of computing that would traditionally have been relegated to the personal computer. So that device is the first device, and the goal is to create the first device that really does put enough RAM, enough compute, enough GPU uh, into your hand to drive a full desktop experience. Um, and it's, it's, it's accelerating innovation on a couple of other key dimensions, the, the battery um, screen and, and a couple of other interesting things. The, the, the second thing that is really interesting about it, and I think the, the more profound thing, um, is the signal that it will send to industry at large. You know, having spent the last couple of months working with um, phone manufacturers and many years working with PC manufacturers, we've realized that, um, that they're in a really impossible position. There are about 20 people in the world who decide what's going to go into the next phone from any major manufacturer, from all of the major manufacturers, right? It's a very, very small group of people. And they have this impossible job, right? They have to innovate. There's an imperative to innovate. But what innovation is really going to matter? Um, and all of the signaling is essentially driving them to being risk averse. Um, so the really extraordinary thing, the thing that I love about this project um, is that it's inverting that and saying, look, let's put both the signal and the risk um, in the hands of the people best able to do it. We've done this for years in open source, right? We've crowdsourced um, intellect, insight, um, and distilled that down into code. Why can't we essentially 
crowdsource insight into innovation and essentially provide industry with this very strong signal about what innovation matters. So, you know, even if if, if um, the EDGE project isn't green-lighted, but I really hope is that somebody else, someone smarter than us, will come up with another definition, another concept, and get that green-lighted. Um, so that's the sort of second really profound thing. And then the third thing that I think is really important is that people are going to do things with that class of device that we can't possibly imagine, right? As a completely open device, that can do everything that a laptop can do. People are going to, I think, really accelerate wearable computing, really accelerate any number of different fascinating areas. Imagine what kids at MIT will do with a bunch of these devices and time to play with them. Um, so for us, the core story here is this convergent story, and, and there's a couple of different elements to that. There's the design. So a design, a family of interfaces. A year ago, I was here and we, we talked through the, the desktop interface, but um, if we're going to converge down into one device that can drive all of these experiences, we have to have a family of interfaces. Each one is really great. There's a great TV experience, there's a great desktop experience, there's a great tablet experience, and a great phone experience. They individually have to be great. They're different because of that, but they have to be part of one family. And I think here you see how that family um, is clearly strongly related. You know what you're doing on any of these devices, but fundamentally they're all, they're all appropriate. Um, and there's another kind of convergence that's really important, which is under the hood, which is to say that um, one device should be able to give you all of those um, all of those different experiences, right? So if I dock my phone, I should be able to get the PC. That means it's exactly the same operating system, right? I can have one device with one operating system, one platform. Um, and there's, a, there's an even bigger kind of convergence, which I think is kind of extraordinary, which is that sort of by happy accident, the operating system that runs on that phone as Ubuntu running on the phone is the same as the operating system that you'll run by default on this new class of extraordinary ultra-dense servers from HP, the HP Moonshot project, right? Thousands of nodes in a rack. Mobile silicon could be x86, could be ARM. Mobile silicon tweaked, repurposed, and fundamentally redefining what's possible in the data center. And I think that's just an extraordinary time of convergence. We've never seen anything like that before, right? Platforms that can span that full range of experiences um, and environments. And that last kind of convergence, I think, is really important for developers. So today, um, I'm, I'm delighted to announce the next version of the uh, SDK for this new generation of Ubuntu, the fully converged experience. And in fact, there are two, um, two faces to that SDK. There's a QML face for native application development for really rich um, environments, rich applications, very smooth transitions, very sexy. Um, we're engaged now with um, uh, you know, the top 50 applications, mobile applications on all of the big stores and, and bringing them to the Ubuntu platform. And for those who want to create rich experiences, this is how they'll do it. Um, the SDK itself is entirely open source. We have a phenomenal community around it. Um, but there's also a, another face that we're announcing today, which is an HTML5 face. So both of these platforms, um, both of these development environments on, you know, comfortable on one platform. You can create the same look and feel, the same interaction dynamics, uh, HTML5, uh, and native QML. So people who've used PhoneGap um, will essentially have their applications working immediately, and a variety of other HTML5 toolkits um, will be brought to the Ubuntu platform uh, as well. So from a developer point of view, um, this is, this is you know, really broad. Uh, we will also support um, uh, Dalvik and Java applications. People who've built Android applications will be able to bring those applications very easily in tree, essentially, um, uh, to the Ubuntu platform. So that's redefining what's possible um, on the client in the PC. Um, um, the other half of, of, of the world today, the, the modern architecture for an application is somewhere distant, you know, in the cloud, somewhere else um, out there on the internet. And there, the, the thing that's really profound for us is this quest for total automation, right? The, 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 the really... Um, uh, wonderful thing about, about cloud computing is that it should enable us to try and, and fail and try again cheaper and faster than ever before. And at an infrastructure level, clearly, you know, we've achieved that, um, uh, whether it's Media Temple or another provider, you're going to find um, that you can get infrastructure, you know, uh, on demand. Uh, if you want to do that for yourself, you can provide that internally with OpenStack uh, or CloudStack and uh, you know, you, 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 you've, you've accelerated your, your, um, your infrastructure world um, dramatically. Um, but as you move up the stack, 
that's, that's really not true. Um, historically, I think the, the Debian approach of saying, well, apt get and go, um, you know, did that 15 years ago. It, it, it accelerated you know, the process of getting and installing software. But the, the real challenge now is um, creating uh, uh, infrastructure or, or software topologies or service topologies that span um, uh, uh, networks of computers. Um, and so this is what an application looks like today. And a year ago, um, I was here, and we sort of mapped this out and said, look, you get whiteboards. If you go into any, the offices of any startup today, you'll see whiteboards with this kind of picture, right? Um, it's not an application anymore. It's a, it's a topology of applications of things that are connected and scaled out and living and breathing, right? And, and it's not a one-time operation either. You're not just creating that and then saying, how nice. Um, you're, you're creating it again and again. You're growing it and shrinking it and, and pruning it like a garden. Um, so Juju is the tool um, that's sort of a layer up from configuration management, a layer up from um, getting software together. Um, and what it does is it essentially allows you to construct that in real life, just like you would draw it on the whiteboard. Um, and a year ago, I sort of came here and showed you this. Um, essentially, a set of command lines that will work on any cloud, or will work on the metal, or will work in memory um, for developers. Uh, so the same set of commands, essentially, that will deploy uh, MongoDB and a node and a node. And of course, there's another set of commands that will um, will scale those things out uh, in memory on a cloud or or on metal. Uh, and the core there is is encapsulation, distilling down into what we call a charm, the, the definition of how Mongo or Node would connect to and talk to all kinds of interesting things. And obviously, as a charm grows over time, it learns you know, how to connect Mongo to more and more different things. It becomes more and more useful in more and more different kinds of topologies and service structures. Um, so today, I want to show you where that's, where that's gone. Um, you, you know, and, and the core story that we wanted to say was, you know, can we replace that whiteboard? Can we take that whiteboard where, where you know, things get scribbled on and then, and then erased and scribbled on and then erased? And can we create you know, something much more interactive? And this is, 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 is where we're at. If you go to jujucharms.com today, um, you'll see um, essentially a, a catalog of of software that's kind of pre-integrated, ready to, ready to con click and connect up together. And in that catalog, you'll find hundreds of things like this, right? Pieces like WordPress, MediaWiki, Ceph, Cassandra, um, and additional glue that kind of connects those pieces up together. Um, but the really cool thing is, is this. If you want, you can just use a, a, a whiteboard. So um, here, say I wanted to, 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 to start with some Ceph. I can do that, and uh, I actually want to scale that out a bit, so I'm going to have 20 nodes of Ceph, um, and you know, for the rest, it's all going to be fairly default. So in memory now, essentially, uh, or on this whiteboard, I now have a, a, a thing that represents 20 nodes of Ceph. And if I hook this up to a cloud, then I actually have 20 nodes building themselves and, and getting ready to connect up to whatever I want to do. And I might say Glance is a, a piece of OpenStack which um, uh, um, uh, coordinates images, so you, you know your machine images are going to be there. And wouldn't it be nice if essentially um, those those machine images were stored in Ceph? So I'm uh, I'm going to do this as highly available. So I'll have two nodes of that. Thank you very much. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a relation, and and because you know these these charms say they can, um, I'll believe that I can just you know draw a line on the whiteboard um, between those two key pieces of infrastructure. And as they say um, on Kitchen TV, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so this is, this is running live on HP Cloud, um, which has um, really great performance. Um, uh, uh, we're having a lot of fun working with the HP Public Cloud team and making sure that Ubuntu is, is just awesome on that, on that cloud. Um, and so this is, a, this is an interesting deployment. It's two separate instances of uh, MediaWiki. Um, on the back end, I've got, I've got two separate clusters of MySQL, and I've got some master-slave replication going on there, um, and, uh, and some uh, 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 both direct database and slave database relationships. So you can see this becomes a um, highly available um, uh, MediaWiki environment. Um, and, 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 and we've evolved a new language, right? A charm is the individual piece of goodness in there, um, but a bundle is the collection of them. Um, and so one of, the, one of the sort of new capabilities in, um, uh, in Juju or in, in, in this GUI is essentially to say, well, can't we just um, wrap that up as a bundle? So if I export that here, I can, I can just uh, save that. I get 
um, some YAML, and you know, that's the definition of a bundle, which can be shared and just thrown at another cloud. So you can whiteboard it out, uh, email it to someone, and then they can throw it up on the cloud or throw it up on metal or throw it up in memory, and they've essentially recreated the infrastructure that, um, uh, that, that you designed. So can we just switch back to the slides? Um, we've moved from um, uh, command line to GUI. Um, we have exactly the same process for dev, test, um, and deployment. So we used to describe this as DevOps distilled, but I think what's, what's evolving now very much is continuous deployment, right? Once you have infrastructure where everything can be totally automated, you have continuous deployment out of the box. So the great thing now is, for those of you who are interested in continuous deployment, if the parts that you want, if the majority of the parts that you want are already charmed, then you have continuous deployment ready to go. You have a, a dev cycle in memory, a test cycle in the cloud, and deployment either in the cloud. Uh, here's the encapsulation story. Each of those charms, you can use whatever you like. You can use Puppet and Chef uh, inside those charms. You can use Bash Python, whatever you like, um, to deploy them. Some news. Um, uh, this week, uh, uh, Juju landed on Mac OS X, so you can sit in a Mac OS X uh, a box for those of you who those the, uh, those of you who love the gilded cage, um, can s <laughs> s sit at your Mac OS X thing. Just pull uh, Juju in from Brew, and uh, and you'll be able to um, uh, build these build these infrastructures in the cloud uh, trivially. Um, some other news, um, containers um, uh, essentially allow you to subdivide machines very, very cleanly. And so Juju is growing some container logic. Um, if we can switch back to the demo machine, um, uh, I can show you now running on um, HP Cloud. I've got a, um, uh, a set of machines there. I can do some cool stuff. I can say Juju add machine, and I'll get another machine in this environment. Um, and uh, then I can say juju um, add machine. But what I really want is uh, what I really want is a container on one of my existing machines, um, so, uh, uh, an LXC container on one of my existing machines. And, and in the community, folks are looking at um, supporting uh, Linux v servers, other container technologies. Um, I'm sure you know everything will get supported in the end. And back to the slides, um, just to wrap up. Um, so that's a charm bundle. I showed you how you can export them from the GUI, pass them around. Um, what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, let's hold a contest to see what the, what the coolest things are that people can construct as bundles. And we've, we've, we've forked the Netflix open source um, uh, uh, um, prize. It's open source, so we didn't need permission, but we did speak with Net Netflix, and Adrian Cockcroft has very kindly agreed to stand as a judge in what we call the, the Charm Championship. And what we're really looking for is these bundles, uh, people to do really cool things that can be shared widely as bundles of those topologies. Um, and, and the prizes will be both for the bundles and looking at them from different perspectives. You know, best bundle for media, it could be content management, it could be, uh, uh, it could be a streaming, it could be transcoding, it could be you know, anything in the media space. Uh, best bundle from a high availability point of view, best use of the capabilities of those charms for high availability. Um, and then we'll also be rewarding the charms that go into those bundles. So there's a lot of room for collaboration between people who are designing those architectures um, uh, and people who are, who are working on the charms themselves. Um, it's all about time, right? How fast can you get these things up? How fast can you scale them? How fast can you evolve them? Security. Um, repeatable, automated best practice, right? If there's a security issue in a deployment, fix the charm, branch the charm, fork the charm, make it better, and, 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 and it gets better for everybody. And performance, right? Do you want to be fine-tuning the performance of every single component, or do you want to be crowdsourcing um, that performance insight? And my time is up. Thank you very much. Have a great, have a great day.